well, good morning. Um, thank you for being here. I was invited today to talk about uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction updates. Um, so let's see if uh, there are any. So um, starting with the terminology, <clears throat> just uh, recently the guidelines have uh, introduced a new um, definition of a mid-range ejection fraction, which is an EF uh, between 41 and 49 percent. So when we are talking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we are talking about an EF that is uh, above or equal 50 percent. What is the challenge uh, with half path? So it is a very common um, entity, so at least 50% of the patients with heart failure will have preserved ejection fraction. There is a very high rate of hospitalizations and a very high rate of mortality. Um, there are many risk factors uh, involved with this entity, uh, advanced age, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, atrial fibrillation, and uh, so far there is uh, no evidence-based uh, treatment that affects outcomes. Uh, we are mainly uh, treating symptoms. And for the diagnosis, there are some biomarker clues such as anti pro BNP or inflammatory markers, but it's still, uh, even if these markers are normal, uh, that does not exclude uh, half path. So, just to put a little bit in perspective, uh, as I said, many risk factors involved, <coughs> such as age, obesity, um, hypertension, kidney disease, and the pathophysiology behind is not yet very well understood. Uh, there is systemic inflammation ongoing, uh, uh, microvascular ischemia, tissue fibrosis, my myocyte hypertrophy, and that all leads to LV uh, structural remodeling. I think important to see in this slide is to recognize that um, we can have any type of uh, LV uh, remodeling, uh, not necessarily the LVH that was previously thought to be necessary for diagnosis of half path. Um, you have abnormal hemodynamics with uh, increased LV filling pressures and decreased organ perfusion, and that will all lead to secondary organ dysfunction and ultimately RV remodeling and dysfunction as well. This is all leads to what to the clinical syndrome that we uh, uh, recognize as half path. So very heterogeneous by clinical presentation. As I said, uh, many uh, mechanisms involve and comorbidities, and also comorbidity that sometimes you think can explain the symptoms of the patients, so lung disease, anemia, aging and deconditioning, obesity. So because of these, there are a few um, uh, scores that have been published out there. More recently, in 2018, uh, the h 2 FPF score, uh, to try to help with the diagnosis of half path. Uh, that is based on obesity with a BMI over 30, uh, hypertension uh, on two or more antihypertensive uh, anti medications, uh, presence of atrial fibrillation, you can see that gives you the, the highest points, uh, pulmonary hypertension based on echocardiography assessment and um, feeling pressure also based on uh, echocardiography assessment with an EE prime ratio of over nine and uh, advanced age. So the more the points you get, the more the probability of having half path. So uh, just recently this year, then uh, ESC uh, came with, uh, uh, it published a document uh, coming with an um, algorithm to help diagnose half path. It's the HFA path uh, algorithm. And that's basically uh, consistent of four steps. So the initial step is um, a pretest assessment uh, for symptoms and signs of heart failure, comorbidities and risk factors in a basic assessment with ECG and uh, standard echocardiography. Uh, the second step uh, consists of more com comprehensive echocardiography measurements, and uh, we'll get to theirs uh, in a minute, and uh, natriuretic peptides um, um, assessment. So. In the second step, if you have, and we'll get there, uh, points enough to make the diagnosis of half path, that's good. If not, then you can go to the third step, which is some more advanced workup, uh, consisting of uh, stress, echocardiography, and invasive hemodynamics. And um, in final, the fourth step, which is a more etiological-driven uh, workup uh, based on the specific um, suspicions you have for cardiomyopathies. <clears throat> 
So for the second step, you do have functional and morphological measurements with uh, echocardiography. Um, each will give if major two points or if minor one point, and also cutoffs for biomarkers, um, <clears throat> also based on sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. If you do reach uh, five points or more, you have a definite diagnosis of half path. If you have uh, one or less, um, then it's unlikely to, to be half path. And if you are in the intermediate range of two to four points, then you go to the third step uh, for further assessment, which consists of uh, stress echocardiography um, with further measurements. And, uh, and if you don't fulfill criteria at this point, you go for invasive hemodynamics, uh, either at rest or uh, during exercise. Um, to have a, uh, an assessment of the uh, wedge pressure. And just the fourth step, as I said, is a more etiological uh, driven and uh, depending on your suspicions for cardiomyopathy, amyloid, uh, HCM, uh, genetic uh, cardiomyopathies, uh, you, you do further assessments. So uh, within the past uh, two decades, many trials have been published in, um, in half path and uh, they mostly failed to show um, significant improvement in outcomes, either morbidity or mortality. So currently the approach has been treatment of symptoms, uh, risk factors, and comorbidities. The CCS guidelines, um, they do have a weak recommendation for cantazartan to reduce hospitalizations in half path, and also um, spironolactone uh, if, you have a, uh, if your potassium and kidney function permits also a weak recommendation. And that is mainly based on, uh, as you know, the CHARM preserved study, which randomized patients to condensartan or placebo uh, with a, a functional class two to four in NEF above 40%, uh, primary outcome of CV death and hospitalizations for heart failure did not, uh, no difference in CV death, but they did see fewer hospitalizations in the condensartan group. And for the spironolactone, um, as you know, top cat in 2014 also did not show, did not reach the uh, primary um, endpoint of CV death, heart failure hospitalizations, or uh, uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest. But when they did the post hoc analysis, they did see difference between um, regions. Uh, so they did see fewer events in the, uh, in, with the spironolactone in patients from America and which was not seen in patients from Russia or Georgia. And, the, and when they split the outcomes, uh, they, they was mostly driven by a heart failure hospitalization, so fewer uh, hospitalizations in patients that received spironolactone, uh, but no difference in cardiovascular death. Just recently, uh, this year, the Paragon uh, heart failure uh, trial, um, which was uh, using a uh, uh, Sacubitril valsartan um, in comparison to valsartan alone in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. That was followed, uh, as all you know, paradigm uh, trial that uh, was done in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. But Paragon did not also uh, show difference in uh, heart failure hospitalizations or cardiovascular death in patients receiving Entresto. One can argue that almost reached statistically significance, but I think the main um, important message from, from this trial we can take is that in a multivariate analysis, uh, they did see uh, fewer events uh, in females in comparison to males, and also in patients that have an EF between 45 and 57% uh, in comparison to those that did have an EF uh, above 57%. Uh, this is just about to be published. This is also from Dr. Solomon and his uh, group. Um, and it's a study that mainly combined Paradigm and Paragon. Um, so they did uh, look into interest across the whole spectrum of ejection fraction in heart failure. And what you see here in red is the uh, female population in blue, the male. Uh, and this is the hazard ratio and the uh, in uh, confidence, uh, interval confidence. And uh, what you see is that uh, for female, um, as Par Paragon showed, you do have a better response and fewer events in the female population, especially in the mid-range or, or preserved ejection fraction in comparison to uh, male. A few uh, studies ongoing, so Emperor uh, preserved, um, 
in, uh, studied in empagliflozin in, in patients with uh, heart failure in preserved ejection fraction. So um, it's, it's in phase three randomized double blind placebo trial in patients <laughs> Uh, regardless of the presence of diabetes, uh, with chronic heart failure and EF uh, and a functional class uh, two to four, with an EF above 40%, so they're being randomized for empagliflozin or placebo. Primary endpoints is uh, CV death and heart failure hospitalizations, and uh, this is uh, follow the EMPAREG uh, trial that was done in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. And uh, it showed that patients had uh, fewer heart failure hospitalizations and in improving survival. Uh, so this is going to maybe shed some light in patients with half path uh, with chronic heart failure, regardless of uh, diabetes. Also this year, as you all know, DAPA HF, um, uh, did reach significant, did reach the primary endpoint of CV death in hospitalizations for heart failure. That was in patients with reduced ejection uh, fraction, uh, uh, and there was a significant uh, reduced in events in patients that received DAPA. So now, following um, uh, DAPA HF uh, delivered trial, it's studying DAPA glyphosate in patients with preserved EF. A uh, randomized multicenter double blind study with patients uh, functional class 2 to 4 and also EF above 40%, uh, which similar primary outcomes. So, just to summarize, um, to date, the trials for half path have not shown consistent, um, clear reductions in morbidity and mortality. I think it's very important to recognize. Um, the mid-range of uh, ejection fraction category while interpreting these trial results. Uh, if you do have a, a benefit from, from, um, from a trial, maybe it's because of this mid-range uh, EF uh, in spite of the ones who have a normal, normal EF. Um, so far, we know that these patients probably respond better to the therapies that are given for patients with reduced ejection fraction, which might not be the truth for half path because it's probably a completely different uh, pathophysiology. Um, also important to recognize that, as I said, they also have uh, other comorbidities that are therapeutic targets, uh, hypertension, AFib, uh, obesity, and diabetes. And um, in clinical practice, you ended up seeing uh, these patients receiving similar treatments as patients with half ref but it's for uh, these other different reasons and not for heart failure.